night uh, at the Alcea Centric booth at the AO annual meeting to start the global converse conversation in the dental space around implant stability. And what does that look like? What is, what is the ideal implant uh, for dental fixation, for dental implants? And so tonight I'm very lucky to have Dr. Charles Schlesinger from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Dr. Robert Stanley from Barry, North Carolina here to speak um, and just really start this conversation regarding mechanical integration and talk about what does that ideal implant look like? And so Dr. Schlesinger, what is mechanical integration? Well, mechanical integration is the exact opposite of what we currently see in dental implants. Uh, currently, what we have is we have a passive thread pattern that gets wedged into the bone in order to gain its stability. And what mechanical integration is the actual thread geometry which grabs onto the bone and allows it to have the stability without having to put undue stresses on the bone and preventing it from being a healthy environment for continued bone growth creating. And how did mechanical integration make its way to the dental industry? Uh, originally, the, the idea of integration or mechanical integration or mechanical locking came from aerospace and from industry and then came into the orthopedic world uh, as it continued its growth in the orthopedic world and it currently is at about 90 level one centers medical centers around the u.s um and then from there it vertically integrated into uh trauma into spinal into veterinary uh, into limb salvage. And so from there, it was a logical progression to move into dental where we basically put it in a screw that we need to last the rest of that patient's up. Thank you. And how is the interface of a mechanically integrated implant different from, let's say, a compressive implant or a standard implant in the dental space? So historically, if you look to the thread patterns on dental implants, there's three main types. There's a square, square pattern that pretty much is called out of favor because, not because of its, of its functionality, but because it's, it doesn't cut the ball. And you have a V type and you have a reverse buttress. Both of those last two designs, what they ultimately do is they compress the ball. And we realize the compression of the ball as it's measured by, so when you have an insertion torque, what you're really measuring is the compression of the bone. The more compression you have, the higher the torque value, okay? With this new thread design, you can insert a dental implant with nearly zero insertion torque. So we're talking like maybe five Newton centimeters, almost, almost you can put it in with your fingers, okay? However, your implant stability quotient, if measured at the time of insertion, is going to be close to 95 which is literally off the chart on ISQ. If you're using ISQ in your practice, you know that a 95 reading is ridiculous. Good. That's mechanical integration. There is no osseum integration at the time of placement of the dental implant. It hasn't occurred yet. And the beautiful thing about it is that if the mechanical integration remains as strong as it is at the time of insertion, and there's not a dip in the stability curve, this is a game changer for dental implants. That means we can go to immediate preservation and maybe go directly to final restoration at the time of placement. And that is, that is an amazing solution for the patient. So you, you take out an ailing tooth, you place in a dental implant, you take a digital impression, and you nail the solution chair side. You could do all of that in under two hours, and that's what it typically takes to do a CIRAC crown. And they're done. Out the door, check occlusion, and you're done. It's gonna be amazing. And so how does a mechanically integrated implant differ then from a compressive implant at time zero? Well, I'll try to add upon what Dr. Sandley had just mentioned because he basically nailed it. Um, the difference is, is that at time zero with a standard implant that's on the market, we're looking at implants that are usually tapered implants and also thread patterns as was stated earlier that cause a lot of compressive force. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking a screw and we're shoving it into a small hole. So the osteotomy is usually smaller than the size of the implant being placed. 
Therefore, in order to get its initial primary stability, it's counting on progressive forces, basically wedging it, no different than putting a screw in a wall, okay, or a screw in a piece of wood. Where MI and unified threads are different is the fact that we're basically using a fully fastened. So it's, as was stated, it's almost a passive fit that goes down since the central core of the osteotomy is larger than the minor diameter of the implant. Therefore, the only thing that is cutting its way through the bone is going to be the, the unified threads. And these unified threads are shaped in such a way that they capture a core of bone in there that can't be dislodged. And therefore, it's going to resist side to side motion. We're going to not see micro movement in the same way. And as we said, it allows for immediate restoration or at least immediate temporization where we normally wouldn't do it. The other situation where it really comes into play is in extraction immediate placement when we only are counting on the tip of the implant and maybe one wall of the socket for support. If we can get these unified crits to engage, then we have support all the way up the total length of the implant rather than just relying upon the apex of the implant to stop our movement during love. So, great. And now, Dr. Stanley, is the surgical technique the same placing a mechanically integrated implant? So the surgical technique is going to be exactly like your traditional technique. You're going to create the osteotomy. And as Dr. Schlesinger said, the, the hole you're making is going to be slightly larger than the minor diameter of your implant. And so you're going to create that osteotomy and you're going to place it. Now, it's not going to feel the same when you're placing that implant, it's not gonna feel the same if you're looking for the tactile feel that you've had with traditional leg plants, because you're not gonna create that friction and that compress them, compression of the bone during insertion. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get that immediate feedback, which is gonna be hard for a lot of old timers because they're gonna say, I don't feel it, I don't feel it. But if they just go ahead and insert it to depth and then check it with an ISQ, you're gonna see that you've got an incredible stability. So after you place a couple of these implants, it's not gonna be very difficult for people to understand. You don't need torque to have primary stability. You could use mechanical integration. All right, thank you. Dr. Schlesinger, in testing uh, mechanical integration and this dental implant in particular, what has been the most interesting oh, thing? I, I think the the most surprising finding was the, the lack of of torque when placing these uh, compared to implants that I've placed for you know the last 25 plus years. I've always looked for stability being equivalent to the torque value that I get, and I've gone through you know torquing implants to 90 newton centimeters and hoping to God that they that they stay stable. I've uh, I've torqued them to 35 because people have said that's all you had to do it and you really were just hoping that they were going to be stable enough to avoid low. What we found was as we were placing these that we were fooled initially I think in cadaveric studies where we placed these and went wow this is this is absolutely ridiculous uh, and then we'd ISQ test them and they would be extremely high on the ISQ scale. The other thing that was really interesting was the lack of loss of stability when doing testing where these have been cycled over and over. So you take a standard buttress uh, threaded or reverse buttress threaded implant and you cycle it 100,000 times and you find that it will initially lose stability and then continue to drop stability over time until at 100,000 cycles, there's nothing. Where we found with unified threads that initial cycling actually increases the build up here, which was a, an interesting finding that we found was backed up by talking and looking at uh, some of the testing that was done on the medical side. And then we saw a very small drop off and then basically a flat line all the way out to close to 100,000 cycles. And at that point, things started to drop off. So to me, the, what that says is that not only is this implant gonna be stable from day one, but over the lifetime of this patient, we're not going to see late failures potentially by the damage that's caused by cycling over and over through masturbatory forces. So to follow up on that, have you all 
looked at any finite element analysis regarding um, the first five threads in particular or the overall length of the implant? Good question. And, and this to me was my kind of aha moment with all this. Um, looking at the finite analysis that, that Hostiocentric has done and then also looking at all of the data and studies that have done in the past, we have in this industry just accepted that the first five threads are going to get the most stress. It is like written in stone. I hate to say it, Mish backed it up and everybody believes it. And we have now tried to find answers for why we continue to lose crestal bone. And for me, I started looking at it a little differently that we're trying to solve a problem for a screw that is not the right not the right mechanism to start with. So what we're, what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a faulty system and trying to find a band-aid for it. And with Unify MI and, and this type of thread pattern, what I believe we're gonna see is we're gonna see initial stability like we've never had before, resistance to micromotion in the early stages of healing, and then carried on to late stage, we're gonna see a resistance to our chewing forces that are going to maintain healthier bone, bone and we're not going to see the same type of bone loss that we do see now. Right now, everybody is focusing on the loss of crestal bone. And my personal theory is, is that we're looking at this backwards. Instead of looking at how we can change the platform, how we can change the abutment, how we can change the restoration, maybe what we have to actually look at is the implant itself. And maybe the problem is that the implant is able to move. And in our FBA, we have seen that we don't have forces that are um, concentrated at the top five threads. We're finding that we have forces equally distributed down the long axis of that implant. And therefore, maybe the bone loss that we're seeing every day is due to a faulty design and then allows for opportunistic bacteria to get in there. And once that mechanism starts, then it just eats itself and we get implant failure. So if we can prevent this type of motion from ever happening and we can keep the stresses distributed equally down the length of that implant, then maybe our crystal bone issues will go away. And we won't have to keep chasing our tails trying to find an answer. That's great, that's exciting. So a question for both of you now. So if, if mechanically integrated implants perform as well in patients as they have done in all of our preclinical testing, how do you see this changing your practice? What benefit do you see to the patient work? So, and I think the answer is staring us in the face. If you look to the marketplace for all on four solutions, what are they called? They're called Teeth Express, Teeth in a Day, Done in One, Teeth Down, right? They're all about speed, time to market, right? Well, the biggest challenge with these is that you don't want to go to finals on implants that have an integrate. But if we can prove out that the mechanical integration holds long enough for osseo integration to take place, that means we can do all on X cases in a couple of hours. We can go straight to final on all on X cases. So for the full mouth cases, they're going to be a huge game changer. Now, if we go from there and say, well, I just lost tooth number eight in the anterior. And, and you only have five millimeters of apical bone at the bottom of the apex of the, of the way the tooth comes out of the socket. You can engage that five millimeters with five threads on this design and have an amazing primary stability that will hold through the entire healing process, which means you can do finals on that as well. So want to talk about a game changer. This is going to really, really catapult our solution because why do we make two lids? We wait three months to restore our osseo integration. But if we don't have this dip and the stability because of mechanical integration, we don't have to wait. And I'm telling you, this is America. We have, we have Amazon stuff is delivered overnight. You know, if you run out of the toilet paper, you got it the next day, right? So we don't wait in America. And this product is perfect for Americans. Sure, good answer. Dr. Slicer, I don't know if I can follow that up, but. Um... You know, for me, I just, I see that the changes and the advantages to my own practice 
um, on a daily basis, it's no different than the changes that occurred when I could start milling my own crowns in my office, same day crowns. You know, if we are, that has been a game changer across the board for dentists all over the world to be able to, to digitally uh, assess a tooth, digitally take an impression, mill a crown, have a patient in and out within an hour and a half to two hours max, and be able to do the exact same thing for implant restorations. You know, single tooth, definitely, like as you stated, full arch, this is a game changer because, the, as you said, the biggest thing that you worry about is you put in four to six implants on an arch and you just hope to God you don't lose any, right? If you subscribe to all on four, we all know the adage, it's all on four and none on three. So, you know, if you have the ability to know that something is going to be there and you can tell that patient that you have got a restoration right away and where the difference is, as you said, these teeth in a day, when I have patients that walk in and say, well, I want teeth in a day, I say, well, you're gonna get temporaries in a day, but you're gonna eat soft food for the next six months. If we can change that paradigm and we can say, yeah, you're gonna get teeth in a day and you're gonna be able to go home and have a regular meal, don't go out and have a steak tonight, but you're gonna have a regular meal, then that's a game changer. And so I see this in many ways, helping us initially and helping us long-term and allowing patients when we can truly say when a patient asks, how long is this implant going to last? I truly feel that we can, without any hesitancy, say this should last you the rest of our life. And that's something that, you know, I say now to patients, but I say with a little bit of trepidation. It's great. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And uh, we look forward to clinically launching this product and seeing where the implant goes in the dental industry. So thank you.